חבר'ה, how are you? I hope everyone is gesund, stark, and feilach, begash me sebruchnis. I hope everyone is healthy, strong, and happy physically and spiritually. As everyone, our hearts and minds are in Eretz Yisrael, and the latest we've heard is that there's been a slight ground offensive, and that there's going to be a greater ground offensive. So today, in addition to starting with a prayer, we'll also add Tzedakah. So we'll have Torah, Aveda, Ogmilas Chasad, and the three things that the world stands on, that the Rebbe would always say, at a gathering to inspire us. We should always do these three things. So we'll start with prayer, Tefillah. Yam Chad, Yinoi B'Yem Tzoro, Yisagev Choshem Olei Yaakov. May Hashem answer you on the day of distress. May the name of Hashem, may the name of the Hashem of Yaakov fortify you. Amen. Now we'll give Tzedakah. It's a pushke. We're giving some Tzedakah. And now we'll speak some Torah, a thought for the week. Parshas Lech Lecha. So the connection to Parshas Lech Lecha and the time that we're in right now is very, very obvious. And that is in this week's Parsha, we have the first war that a Jew fought. And that's the famous war where Avram is battling the four armies of the four kings. So therefore, we have questions. Basically, primarily, I'm going to review a talk of the Rebbe, which is non muga from Parshas Lech Lecha Tavshin Mem Ches. So we'll take a word from that. It was a Rashi Sicha. And based on that, we'll build. Baruch HaTorah Adinei Eleinu Melechim Shachal Nia Bidvari. Excuse me. So, when it comes to the war, we'll start with the Rashi Sicha, the Rebbe's question. And also, this week's Pasha introduces a new character that we haven't spoken about before, and that is Eliezer. And actually, we'll see what the Pasuk says about him. And it says over here that when it came to the war, where Oigmel Chabosham came to Avram and told him that his nephew Loit was captured by these four kings, and we once spoke about this before. Why did Oig think that Avram was going to go on such a suicide mission? Who is Avram? He's fighting four nations? But Oig already knew about Avram, he was a man of faith. And they would have self-sacrifice. And we're going to talk about the self-sacrifice soon. So therefore he knew that by telling Avram that his nephew was kidnapped, was a prisoner of war, he would follow him. Even though Rashi says that Oig's intention was that Avram should get killed, obviously, because he looked at it in a natural way. How could Avram survive this war? Because these four kings, these four nations were mighty. They defeated an army, five armies, five nations. And here, Oik thought he'll tell Avram, Avram is recklessly, because he's a do-gooder, he's going to run to rescue his nephew, but he's going to die, he'll get killed in the war. That was Oik's intention, to marry Sarah. In any case, so, Avram goes into the war, and then it says that he took 318 men. So the Pasuk says, Vayishma Avram kinish ba'achiv, he heard that his brother was taken captive, it means his nephew, but the Pasuk calls him his brother. Vayorek es chanichov, he armed his initiates. Yelide Beisai, who had been born in his house. Shmoina osor Meis, 318. Vayidev adon, and he gave chase as far as done. So, on these words over here, that it says that he armed his initiates, and it was 318, Rashi brings that Rabbi Seinu Omru, our sages say, Eliezer levade hoya. It was only Eliezer. V'hu minyin gemati yishal shmoi. The word Eliezer, if we add up all the Hebrew letters, equals to 318. So we hear the Rebbe asks Akasha, how could Rashi bring this Rabbi Seinu Omru when it's so contrary to what the Pesach says straight away? The Pesach Regularly, it said there was 318 men. Where do we find such a thing? 
The Pasuk says straight up there were 318 men. And the Rashi says, Rabbi Sayyid Amru, our sages say, it's Eliezer Levadoi. Eliezer alone. You know, that's pretty different. And but wait, there's more. Later on, when Malchitzedek wants to offer Avram the spoils of war, Avram declines, and we'll speak about that later. And all he says is that, and he, and he, and he says, he's not taking any of the spoils. He just says, Rakasha Ochlu Hana Orim. So he says, only what, only what the young men have eaten, he means the people that went with him into the war. So we see another Posik. Not only Chenichov, but then Hanarim. So we see from, which is Lashon Rabbim, plural. So that means that there's more than only one. So we have to understand what's going on there. So to understand it, first, we have to question, why is the Torah elaborating so much on this story of the war? Many commentators speak about it. And I think that someone who reads the Bible Chas Vashalom in the wrong way, will take a wrong message from here. And we would like to emphasize the opposite message totally and to see the way it is in Torah. And with this, we will shed light on the notion of a hero. Many narratives in fiction, and I once heard a rabbi say, the difference between the Western concept of a hero and Judaism's concept of a hero, that in the Western culture, secular view, the hero rescues the damsel in distress, conquers, slays the dragon, and wins the girl. So it's about physical prowess. And in Judaism, who's the hero? The shepherd who runs after the one lamb who strayed from the rest of the flock. This point is a beautiful point, and this is the point I want to emphasize. Today we're going to talk about the principles of war, in the Jewish perspective, and we'll also talk about the idea of what makes a hero. And a hero is the one who is a symbol, a paragon of humility and selflessness. That's the definition of a hero, and that's what we're going to see in the story of Avram, as we'll explain. But first, let's answer the question. So right away in Lech Lecha, what's the first story that's discussed about the adventures of Avram? Okay, he picked himself up and he left. But that doesn't sound like anything special. He left one place of residence and went to another. Of course it was one of the tests. Of course it shows that unwavering faith, pure faith in Hashem, that even though Hashem didn't tell him where to go, he went. Fine. It's extraordinary. But it, but if we talk about feats, <laughs> we're going to say, so Avram left everything and followed Hashem's word. It doesn't make a book of adventures. And then afterwards what happened with uh, Avimelech, etc. But what's the first grand adventure? Is this story with the wars. But you know, usually when people speak about Avram, and they'll say, where do we see Avram's kindness in the story with the three angels, even though he was circumcised, and he was in pain, and he was unwell still, he was busy, busy looking how he could help another person. But really we're mistaken. We're overlooking this story. This story is the beginning of a grand adventure and a testimony of Avram's character and integrity. Why? So, first of all, what the Rebbe says is, obviously, the reason why this story was mentioned here is to bring out miracles. That miracles are done for Avram. Actually, Rashi himself brings it out. Besides for the fact that it was a small army, 318 men, as we'll soon explain. Besides for that, as we know what the Medrash says, Avram picked up dust to turn into spears. The earth itself became weapons. And the Medrash says also that he um, threw straw and it turned into arrows. So that's one miracle. And the miracle that he overcame all those armies a small army of 318 men defeated four nations, four army with thousands, four armies. So therefore the emphasis over here is that there was a ness, but look what Rashi says over here also, that the night was divided into two. Half the night was divided for Avram 
It was a night of miracles. It was Leil Tesvov. So we see that Rashi, who is Pshut HaShemikra, is telling you that in the story itself, when you're learning Chumash, the Pasuk is telling you that it was split into two. Hashem split that night into two. It was the night of the 15th of Nisan. One part of the night was the miracles that was done for Avram, and the other part was saved for the Yidden hundreds of years later, Leil, Yitzhiyas, Mitzrayim, Tesvav, Nisan, the night that the Jewish nation went out of Egypt. So that's how much, when we talk about miracles, we talk about the miracles of Yitzhiyas, Mitzrayim, and we talk about this miracle, they're put together, equal, on the night of Tesvav, Nisan, there were two miracles that happened. One miracle was the miracle of Yitzhiyas, Mitzrayim, connected to the birth of the nation. The other miracle, a miracle that happened to Avram, the first Jew. So we see how important is the stress of the miracle aspect to this story, and that's why Rashi mentions it. As the Pshat and the Posik, that the night it was split into two. So now, part of that miracle is, this is the Rebbe's answer to the question about Eliezer, that there was a person named Eliezer who was also one that miracles were done for him. Like 318 men, having Eliezer with you was the power of having 318 men. So according to Rashi, the Rebbe says, the posh, the pshat, that he took the Na'orim, he had other boys, and he had chenichov, that remains. He had 318 people also, as the Pesach says. But Eliezer was equal to all the other 318. That miracles also happened through him. And that's when Avram Taka realized how amazing Eliezer is. That even though Eliezer is one person, but we know that Megalgal Schusai de Zakai, miracles, open revealed miracles, don't happen to every single person, only to Tzadikim, holy people, special people. And here the Abishta brought through Eliezer, he was a conduit, he was a receptacle, he was a vehicle through which Hashem performed miracles. And that's why he was equal to 318 men. And that's why also Avram mentions right after this episode when he says that I don't have any children and therefore Eliezer is going to be the sole benefactor, the, the inheritor. Even though the Pashto Pshat and the Pasik is bitter, Avram is saying this bitterly, but it also wasn't with an awareness that the next one who was going to be like the successor, who was going to keep this movement going, would have been Eliezer. And the reason why Avram was able to even say those words, that the one who was going to continue was going to be Eliezer, because he saw his greatness. He saw him as his greatest disciple. And as in many cases of movements, when the disciple is a tzaddik, and the disciple is a scholar, and the disciple can continue teaching the ways of the master. And that's actually also, as Rashi brings down over here, talking about Eliezer, that he came from Damasek. The Pasuk says he came from Damasek, and the Gemara says the word Damasek, Damascus, means, we can learn Pshat, He was someone who drew, drew the water from the well from his master, and he gave it to others. So here we see how Eliezer is amazing. Now we understand the questions on Rashi. And now we understand why it's part of the narrative in this story of the adventure of the battle because it's connected to the miracles. Eliezer's performance in the war, that he was equal to 318 men, was also one of the miracles that happened in this war. Now let's talk about some of the lessons, which I think are amazing. If we talk about the principles of warfare in Judaism, so let's talk about some of the things. The main point is over here, the idea that <laughs> miracles happen. Connected to the concept, the subject, which we've spoken many times, the immortality of the Jewish nation. Nitzchis am Yisrael. Which no matter what happens, we say, And then we say with a certainty, with an absolute conviction, how can we say that with an absolute conviction? Both first part, 
Alas, which we've seen proven to be true. But the main point, because we have a special connection starting with this first war that the first Jew was involved in, that we saw these miracles. And we'll get back to this, because that's the overriding main theme that we have to take concerning this, the lesson and the takeaway that we take from this story is the miracles. But before that, let's talk about some other minor things connected. Lessons that we take from this. Number one, that Avram is ready to go on Mesiris Nefesh. As Rashi explains why the Pasuk emphasizes that the four beat the five to show how mighty, formidable of an opponent were these kings. And nevertheless, Avram selflessly goes to rescue the kidnapped late. So here we see the Jewish way in warfare that will do everything, everything to take care of family, to take care of someone that was connected. As we saw recently, many years ago, when we gave away 1,000 prisoners. I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I just want to bring out a point. We let go 1,000 prisoners for one Jewish soldier who was kidnapped. So that just proves the point. Without going into what the Das Torah is just in that particular case. But to the world it proved the point. We're ready to give away 1,000 just for one. That's how precious and valuable our people are to each other. So here goes Avram chasing, you could call it, like we said before, a suicide mission to rescue his nephew. He's going with 318 men against four nations. So that's one lesson in Jewish warfare. And it brings out the point of selflessness, dedication and care for the other. Point A. And every point I'm going to bring out is going to bring out this idea, like that sheep that lamb that strayed from the flock will go to inordinate lengths, exceedingly, exceedingly slim chances even, but we'll do it anyways, because that's who we are. Selflessness. That's number one. Number two, so it's number one, the attachment. It's for family, brother, sister, that will go to such lengths. So it's about the other. Then, this is another detail in that itself. Even when it's against insurmountable odds and impossible odds, we'll still have that Mesiras Nefesh. So that also shows on selflessness. Not only general, that it's about the other person, but also even in the most extreme difficult circumstances. And then afterwards, look at the story where after Avram won the war for, against the four kings, so one of the kings that was then, they were released, and they, uh, so they wanted to offer Avram the spoils of the war, and Avram says the famous words, Michut from a thread to his shoelaces. He's not taking anything. So again, why? Because if he's a Jew, it's not about the reward, and it's not about any ulterior motives. How many nations went to war, and the whole objective was material gain? throughout history. And over here, the war is only about defense, to save the abductee, to save the kidnapped person. So in other words, the general, what's the war? The war is about defense, security, helping. And he doesn't want that anybody should even suspect that there's any ulterior motive or any personal gain whatsoever, so he refuses to take anything whatsoever. And on the contrary, it says he gives Meiser to Malki Tzedek. So, <laughs> look how the Torah perspective, Vudas Gehed Givon. Where do we ever find such a thing? The victor of the war usually gets a ticket, a taper parade, I don't know what it's called, down Fifth Avenue. He's the victor. And the spoils of war go to the victor. And here we see the Torah view. The polar opposite. Not only he's taking pride, not only he's not boasting, not only he sees himself hail the conquering hero, on the contrary, he's taking nothing for himself, but not only he's not taking nothing for himself, not only he's taking nothing for himself, he's actually giving. 
and he gives him a kitzedek ma'aser. Wow! Look at the lessons. What we have to take from this. Now I just want to go back to the point that there was a miracle here. So like we said, the miracle was the sand turned into spears, the straw turned into arrows. But the main point, I think, which is on a personal level, and this is what the Rebbe emphasized every single time the Jewish people are in trouble. We, me, you, the person I'm talking to you right now, my students, we have to realize that the message is to us. Chassidim. And the message we have to take is a message that the Rebbe spoke after the Yom Kippur War. He didn't connect it to this story in Chumash, but I think it's connected in a major way, and this will be the first time. There's different ways how miracles happen. In the story of Hanukkah, we emphasize that it was the Rabbim biyad ma'atim, the many lost to the few. The Rebbe, in the Sikh of Yutes Kist of Tafshan Lamadalid, spoke very much about the idea of quality versus quantity. That in the olden days, they thought the greater the army, the more people in the army, that would be the more victorious army. And the same thing when it came to weapons. The bigger the weapon, the mightier the weapon is. Even in our day, before, besides for the, even nuclear bombs, they made small weapons and with bigger weapons, big guns, the biggest guns, the biggest, biggest guns, were able to shoot the furthest. So how do we measure power? Power was measured in terms of quantity. How many tanks does this army have? How many tanks does that army have? And the one who had greater quantity was considered the one who would be more victorious. And that's how we're going to place the odds. Now what we saw with Israel, Eretz Yisrael, miracles of miracles. In the Six Day War, in the Yom Kippur War, we were outnumbered. If we look at it on the part of the quantity, these were absolute, stupendous, wonderful miracles of quality defeating Quantity. In Lashon Kaidish, in the Torah language, it's called Echus over the Kamos. But really, you could also talk of it of the conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Similar to the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. What does it mean the pen is mightier than the sword? It means an idea is much more powerful than a tank, much more powerful than a bomb. You could have a nuclear bomb and it's not going to wipe, wipe out an idea, a notion of individuality, of creativity, of agency, autonomy, things like that. And this is what we see from this story, the first story, the first war, where the quality beat the quantity, where the triumph over, from the spirit over the flesh was this story, the war of Avram, of 318 men. And Avram stands for justice. Avram stands for what's right. And we have to make a comment here that not always do we see that right is might. That right has more power in the physical sense. But Hashem makes a miracle. But if right has might, sometimes, like at the end of World War II, obviously, the United States Army, the United States, had a more powerful army than the, the, the Nazis, the Shemam, therefore they won. So there's nothing wrong when you say that right also has might. But we're saying the point is that even when right has might, which is good, that's the way it should be, but what's driving the right? The fact that it's right that its morality is clear, that it's on the right side, that it stands for kindness, that it stands for compassion, that it stands for care, that it stands for selflessness, that it stands for humility. And then, Baruch Hashem, there are times we see that not only those things alone could beat something which is far, far greater in quantity, but sometimes the quality and the quantity merge that even the quality has quantity. So let's talk about it in practical words. We're talking now 
that even whenever there was a war, the Rebbe would emphasize always, we have to stress the spiritual war. The spiritual war means if you're fighting the war, you have to realize what we're fighting for. We're fighting for life. We're fighting for the forces of goodness and kindness. And we're fighting, and we have the right spirit. And this is what the Alter Rebbe says in Ultra in chapter 26, talking about this idea between the spirit and the flesh. The Alter Rebbe says in chapter 26 of the Tanya, a famous analogy, if you have two opponents, even if one opponent is much more powerful physically, but if he's not with the right morale, he's not enthusiastic about it, he's not positive about it, he doesn't have the right hope, he's not marching with the joy, if his motivation is weak, he will lose. The Alter Rebbe says that clearly. So therefore, what the lesson we have to take each one of ourselves, and also in general, we have to emphasize the spiritual aspect of the war. We're connected to the Eibishter. As the famous saying goes, As If you're connected above, you don't fall down below. As in every single story of war, like Avram, who understood, and you'll see in the Pesukim over here, he keeps on mentioning Hashem, that it was Hashem who brought him to success. And then right afterwards, Hashem says, Anoichi Moginloch, I will protect you, just like you were protected in this war, you'll be protected in the future. We have Hashem's promise. That's, act, act, that's actually also the meaning of the Vihisham, the prayer, that we say at the Seder, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Eimideleinu, Umatzileinu Miyodom, it starts with Vihi Sha'om the Laviseinu. And what is the Vihi? Hashem's promise that the Jews will never be destroyed. We are invincible. Just as Hashem is invincible, we are invincible. But what each and every single one of us has to do is to focus more on the spiritual as individuals. Just like we understand, the person could lift 500 pounds and he could be an Olympic champion and he could be an NBA athlete. But if his mental health is not okay, or his emotional state is not okay, then obviously the physical is not going to be so important. So what we have to focus on is mental health. Mental health by learning Torah, inculcating yourself with Torah perspectives. Then you're mentally healthy. And the same thing is your emotional state of being. Hey, bon davenin. Daven with emotion. Do your um, spiritual cardiovascular exercise, which is davening. And the same thing is by doing charity. So the Ebisha should help that we should see with our physical eyes the victory of the right side. And this should bring us to the ultimate miracle, just like we saw the miracles in the times of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we should see the miracles, open revealed miracles, Begula Shlema, take it from Yad Mamish. One more point I want to say, I'm sorry, but it's so important that we see that even a disciple of Avram, a chassid, who's connected with Avram, but he could be considered like 318 men. So that shows that on the responsibility Whoever you are, your disciple that's connected to a Torah special Jew, even if you're just the one who is Dailo Mashke, Mirabai La you take from your master and you spread his words, then you also get special powers. We should all exercise our special powers by spreading the teachings of our masters, and that will intensify our mental health, which in turn will intensify our total spiritual health and will bring us the victory of the Gula Mitzvah Shlema. Take it from Yad Mamish.